Let's all wait a couple seconds for people to show up. As you can see, the sun is setting here. I'm going to try and like find things to say to fill in time, but I'll probably just end up clipping out the beginning of this. We got a couple people in here. Okay, he hello everybody. So let's get going. I want to talk about a. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to do a live stream. I haven't done it in a long time, and it, it's kind of fun. And that way, as I'm talking about things, you can ask questions. And uh, I don't have much like prepared that I want to talk about. I just uh, had a, a brief passage that I wanted to bring up uh, from the epilogue of Nietzsche contra Wagner. Can everybody hear me all right? I'm just using the mic on my phone right now, so let me know in the chat if you're unable to hear me or if it's super quiet or anything like that. Uh, all right, so yeah, I've got a Kaufman's Portable Nietzsche here. And So this, it's from the epilogue, so he's got Nietzsche contra Wagner as uh, one of the last sections. It's actually the very last section of anything from Nietzsche's work that he talks about. Uh, and I was just looking through this today, and I was thinking about something in Beyond Good and Evil, which is the idea of the mask. If you've been listening to the podcast on the RSS feed, then you've heard this discussion of Beyond Good and Evil already, where we get to the part about the mask. If you're just watching on YouTube, then you've only seen the first part of the Beyond Good and Evil discussion, so we haven't quite gotten yet. So I'll just give a brief recap on the idea of the mask. Well, Nietzsche talks about, uh, I, be I believe the line is, whatever is profound loves masks, and whatever is most profound even hates image and parable. What does that mean? Well, he goes on to say that, could it be that for the shame of a god it would require nothing less than the mask of its very opposite in order to conceal this. In other words, for a being whose shame, so, you know, a god's shame, thinking of like an ancient Greek god or something like that, uh, they would, you know, they're titanic in their proportions, so they would even have the most titanic shame. So would they require the most powerful type of mask to mask their shame? And Nietzsche suggests the most powerful type of mask is actually the opposite of whatever the internal content is. What he means by this in practical terms, uh, I go into great detail in analyzing this passage of sort of like commonplace psychological examples of this. But I mean, the easiest example would be, you know, methinks she doth protest too much, right? When um, somebody suggests something about you or someone else for that matter, anybody, and there's like a really vehement contrary or even contrarian response to that, uh, characterization of you. Uh, now, in many cases, this might be kind of obvious, right? Or, you know, you, you might say that um, we don't look at this as something that is, uh, I don't, I don't want to say admirable, but uh, this is often thought of as sort of like a character flaw, maybe. Um, but Nietzsche, I think, would suggest that this is just like a basic I don't want to say defense mechanism, psychological function a way that we project something opposite in our appearance from what is internal. The important point is when he says whatever is most profound even hates image and parable, the way we would normally talk about masking something, right, would be in the form of an image or parable. So taking a psychological trait that you have or something about your life, something about you, and veiling it in some way, making it less pronounced or, uh, you know, like the idea in religious language of, say, like communion. Communion is like an imagistic parable, the idea of like taking the bread and wine, the holy sacrament. You're literally, you know, in the metaphor, eating 
God's flesh and drinking his blood. But it's not supposed to be something that morbid. It's supposed to be a parable, an image of you becoming one with the divine, with the Godhead, through consuming it, right? And apparently this isn't just found in Christianity. There's a bunch of religions where God eating is, like, part of the, the right and a lot of, uh, going back to, like, religions of totem and taboo, uh, you know, tribal religions, old, old school religion, pagan religion, animism. God eating is a aspect of uh, rituals that goes back, uh, you know, centuries or millennia. So why do I bring this up? The point being that you're trying to get across this metaphysical idea of the coming together of the human and the divine. You're not masking it, though, because you're not portraying the opposite of that. What you're doing is you're putting it into an image. You're putting it into a parabolized story. What, some, what Nietzsche's pointing out is, like, that's not how we mask ourselves, or uh, that's not how we conceal, right? To properly conceal, you project the opposite. So, why do I bring all this up about masking? Uh, in this epilogue, in Nietzsche contra Wagner, uh, Nietzsche writes the following, quote, I have often asked myself whether I am not more heavily obligated to the hardest years of my life than to any others. As my inmost nature teaches me whatever is necessary, as seen from the heights and in the sense of a great economy, is also the useful par excellence. One should not only bear it, one should love it. Amor fati, that is my inmost nature, and as for my long sickness, do I not owe it indescribably more than I owe my to my health? I owe it a higher health, one which is made stronger by whatever does not kill it. I also owe my philosophy to it. Only great pain is the ultimate liberator of the spirit, as the teacher of great suspicion, which turns every you into an X, a real genuine X, that is the letter before the penultimate one. Only great pain that long, slow pain in which we are burned with green wood, as it were, pain which takes its time. Only this forces us philosophers to descend into our ultimate depths and to put away all trust, all good-naturedness, all that would veil, all mildness, all that is medium, things in which formerly we may have found our humanity. I doubt that such a pain makes us better, but I know that it makes us more profound. So, the, the reason why I bring this up in relation to the mask is there's also a letter that Nietzsche wrote, I believe it was to Erwin Rode, uh, it might have been to friends, of, one of his friends, I don't quite remember, where Nietzsche says that um, his sort of riposte, his counter against um, his own sense of vulnerability and suffering from his illness and that's clearly what he's talking about in this epilogue of Nietzsche contra Wagner, is that he has this long illness that plagues him his entire life and makes him sort of a weak, sickly, vulnerable person. And his way of countering that, of feeling that way, is to affect a philosophy of hardness or harshness. And when I was reading this epilogue, in Nietzsche contra Wagner, it struck me yet again, this is Nietzsche in some sense <laughs> creating the mask, which is the opposite of how he actually, what his actual experience of the world is. And this is in some sense, because you could take a really cynical view of that, right? You could sort of see it as, I mean, let's put it in internet language. That's a cope. Nietzsche's just coping. He, you know, uh, he feels like this weak, sickly person, so he fantasizes in the realm of philosophy. He creates this harsh philosophy of, you know, affirming the morality of the bird of prey and the aristocratic radicalism and all these things, and uh, rejecting pity, rejecting compassion and things like that. Um, and so it's in many ways the opposite of what you feel that a person who was sickly, 
vulnerable, incapacitated much of the time because of his illness. It is the opposite of what you think that such a person would project. And that's the reason why I think it's not, it's not exactly cynical, though, because of some of the things he talks about in this passage, that he says he owes his whole philosophy to this condition, to the fact that he's been forced to struggle with what he's called, he calls a long pain, the kind of pain that takes its time. Like he's being burned on a pyre, burned by green wood at the stake, right? Uh, wood that's fresh and is going to take a long time to really burn and catch fire. Um, like Nietzsche has been slow roasted, or you know, smoked over his whole life. And that, that really is what his illness was like, uh, for what I get the impression from reading, you know. Uh, and the letters that he sent in the last years of his life, like when Georg uh, Brandes, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, Danish fella, uh, the guy who coined the term aristocratic radicalism. Uh, Nietzsche says that, you know, I'm three quarters blind by now. I'm not, he's explaining to this guy that I'm not a professor anymore because in Brandis's like Nietzsche, he says, oh, I see you're a professor with a doctorate. And Nietzsche says, uh, no, I'm, I'm three quarters blind by now. And in correspondences and conversations that were documented in the years before that, you can kind of see the chronology of how he very slowly has his sight taken away from him, his headaches become worse and worse. It's funny, the last year, his last productive year, his headaches mostly go away. Um, and then that's like right before his collapse. It's this weird calm before the storm. Um, but, you know, his stomach problems get worse. And, uh, you know, he closes his eyes. He sees these visual phosphines and all of these things. So... And it, but it's such a gradual process, like chipping away at him, right? And so, and you may have noticed the the uh, aphorism from Twilight of Idols that is contained in um, contained in that epilogue, uh, where he says, you know, that the kind of pain that makes stronger what it doesn't kill, right? It's the same as the from the military school of life, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. So that's the way Nietzsche sort of conceives of what his chronic pain, his medical condition, has done to him, is that it's actually strengthened him. And I basically see this as like, so going back to why I don't think the mask is just such a cynical thing, it's only a moral prejudice that the truth be worth more than mere appearance. It might even be the most badly approved, uh, most badly proved assumption that there is. It's from Beyond Good and Evil. Right, and so much of that work is based on reclaiming the world as appearance and getting rid of this Kantian notion that there's like a true objective world that is a world of universal objective truths uh, that we should instead sort of reconfigure our view of what truth is to what appears most strongly that the gradient uh, the truth might be a gradient of that which is most apparent and so that the phrase, the apparent world, right? For a long time in German philosophy or in just philosophy generally, the apparent world was sort of seen as like the merely apparent world. This was like a derogatory phrase or like denigrating the world of phenomenal experience, right? This is simply what appears to us, but we don't know that it has any substance, any being, any actual like real reality behind it. Um, and Nietzsche is flipping that on its head in some way and saying what is actually real is what appears. I mean, this is just Heraclitus. If you've been listening to the uh, podcast since the beginning, you know all this because it's the first aphorism that we, we covered. And so I think this has like a really profound link with the idea of the mask. That what Nietzsche is doing in some sense is actively willing to take the circumstances that should turn him. So what he feels on the inside is this weakness, this sickliness, this vulnerability. That's his subjective experience, his immediate experience for whatever that's worth. And by all accounts, that should turn him into somebody who produces a weak and sickly philosophy. And by this like active revaluation of what pain and suffering is and means and the value of it, he like forces himself to write this philosophy whereby 
no, uh, pain actually has positive aspects and is a creative force. I'm going to affirm life, not just in spite of this, but uh, wholeheartedly, I'm going to accept this and embrace it. And that's going to involve, I mean, if his world, right, the, the immediate experience that Nietzsche lives in is a world of pain, if that is his physiological reality in which he lives, that is what is most apparent to him, is his pain and suffering. The fact that his, like, his life, his sanity, is just slowly being like siphoned away from him before his very eyes. Uh, or not before his eyes, because he's going blind. But uh, you know what I mean? That he's taking this and saying, I'm going to, what I write, what I show to the world, the persona that I adopt, because persona means mask, right? <laughs> uh, what, that's what it means to be a person, is to be a mask, to project this outward uh, personality or character. What I project outwardly will be this... Uh, valuation, this morality from the military school of life, that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And that's, that's why I think it's not just so simple as to say it's just a cope. Now, is Nietzsche coping? Yeah, I mean, obviously he is. He's coming up with a life philosophy whereby he can live and affirm life even given what his life is, the painful reality that his life is. But by taking on the mantle of this philosopher of life is suffering and yes, I am still pro-life, I still affirm life, I still say yes to it by embodying this harsh realist philosophy of Thucydides and of, uh, you know, his figure of Zarathustra and so on and so forth. Nietzsche actually becomes that because that is the persona that he crafts. That's the way he appears to the world, right? And that's what his legacy is. That's what he has uh, made the name Nietzsche and Nietzscheanism to mean, is this worldly life philosophy which affirms pain and suffering as this creative force that makes you profound, that makes you complex, deep, able to touch the deepest insights, skim beneath the surface. Um, and so I guess I would say I don't know if I have like a, I, I'm just sort of like bouncing ideas here in a way. So I don't know if I have a quick summary of what I'm trying to say necessarily. It's almost as if the idea of the mask in Nietzsche has these two elements to it, right? If to truly create a mask, you're actually in a way, you could look at it like the Jungian shadow, or something like that, nature, that like what you have in your unconsciousness Oftentimes you're projecting the opposite to the outside world. But there is a way, as an artist, right? This might be what you would call giving style to one's character, as Nietzsche talks about. Where you can make this an act of self-creation. Where this projection of a, quote, mere appearance, what we thought of as a mere appearance, uh, overtakes or overcomes or sublates whatever it is that you have inside. And what is that, anyway? Right? <laughs> like, uh, or what, which of it has, which of it is the truer truth or the truer reality? Uh, because ultimately, we don't know what Nietzsche experienced on the inside, right? Or, or we should just say, we don't have access to it empirically. What we do have access to empirically are the things that Nietzsche wrote and said. That's like the legacy that he leaves behind in his philosophy. So, with all that being said, uh, let me look down, uh, look through some of the chats here, and let's just get into interacting. Uh, somebody says, I love your channel, man. I've been obsessed with Nietzsche for years. Just finished Zarathustra for the fifth time. Wow. I kind of get it now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I. There are... Zarathustra is like a prose poem. So... <laughs> You could probably read it five more times, and there still will be new things that you will encounter um, every time. Uh, Dionysian Apollo, nice username, I like that. You have a nice reading voice. Thank you, sir. Uh, someone else says, I mean, you literally had some type of chronic, weird chronic disease. True. Uh, let's see, let's see, find a question. Here we go, here's a question. Thoughtery historian. In your opinion, what opinions would Nietzsche 
changed, I assume he means would Nietzsche have changed if he lived through the 20th century? Uh, I know I could talk about war and technology and, uh, you know, many of those things. I think, hmm, I think the changes in the systems of government or like, how would I put it? Not systems of government, the complexity of modern society and like the ascendance of a sort of, what would you say? I've often called it like the technocratic managerial state or something of that nature. Um, I think he might have, I don't think he would have changed his initial presuppositions or convictions about like democracy and monarchy and oligarchy and these things. But I think he might have changed how he practically applied his philosophy or how he would like practically consider um, the reality of uh, what government had become. Like, I think Nietzsche would have seen beyond, this is really what I'm trying to get at, I think he would have seen beyond the simple bifurcation into, like, authoritarianism and democracy and realized that, um, as Mikkels pointed out, among other people, that there's this weird kind of convergence of aristocracy and democracy that begins to happen, that happened in the Soviet Union, arguably uh, happened here. I, I mean, it, it really, it's strange. It's like we, I talked about this during the political philosophy season on the episodes on socialism, capitalism, and fascism. Um, in a way, all of these ideologies are this like aristocratic democracy in, in a sense. And where, what would you put it? Like fascism is openly authoritarian, right? But it, you can't conceive of it without this democratic energy. Um, and similarly, you know, communism is supposed to be uh, the abolition of all economic classes, but then it creates this, like, bureaucratic collectivism, uh, as Trotsky called it, right? It creates a new oligarchy. And then over here in liberal democracies, we would consider ourselves like the purest form or like the most free of, um, you know, any, any of those other two systems. But what we've ended up doing, having been given decades and decades to elaborate on the liberal democratic project, is created an incentive structure that's so, what would you say, it's so complex and multifaceted, the incentives that drive action, and they don't come from any one like centralized place or top-down structure, that it's people's lives, I think many people have, have, have figured out, people's lives are like more tightly controlled and regulated now than they've ever been, mostly as a result of just like technology advancing. But because of the nature of the system we live in, most people aren't even exactly sure like where the control is coming from, right? That's part of what democracy does. Like we don't know, we don't know who to blame exactly or people do you know they come up with all sorts of people to blame but it's not obvious like a lot of the debates that we have in political life are the debates over who's to blame for why x y or z problem even happened in the first place like you ever notice that like when, when there are debates like um you know someone will say well this is because the government did this regulation and the other side will be like no that's because big business was doing this x y and z and so we can't even agree on like who's really quote unquote in charge. Um, and so this diffusion of responsibility and the fact that I, for, in my opinion, most of it is like a decentralized incentive structure system that just operates on its own and has its own internal logic in a way. Um, and that makes it very difficult for us to adjust course. Uh, Let's see what else. Nietzsche would have had a told you so moment in World War One. That's certainly true. Um, although a lot of people saw World War One coming, it was just that there was this international peace movement, probably for the first time, because people were perceiving that there was this like really scary arms race going on. Uh, let's see here. 
someone says they have multiple sclerosis based on the events that took place in his life. It sounds like a similar disease. There are several wasting type diseases. Uh, Catacil is the theory that I believe in. It's like a congenital stroke disorder. But he also had some sort of indigestion problem, chronic indigestion or inflammation. Um, Nietzsche was just a physiological wreck, right? Um, he was uh, one of the most maladjusted life forms that have ever walked this earth. And he's the guy who wrote The Week and the Botch uh, Shall Perish, and we should even help them to do so. So what is that if not the mask of its opposite, right? Uh, I feel that if Fred had been introduced to tantric Buddhism, he might have changed his opinion of the benefits potential of the philosophy. Very eternal return, Amor Fati. Hmm. The end of that last... I guess I know what you mean, maybe, uh, with that last remark, but I'm not exactly sure. Tantric, tantric Buddhism. I'm only cursory familiarity with tantric Buddhism. Um, I imagine that it's related or very similar to Vajrayana, though, right? Because Vajrayana incorporates Chod, which is like the uh, local black magic system, right? And like tantras into it. So like I know there's some... I, I studied a little bit of Vajrayana. That's Tibetan Buddhism, for those of you who don't know. Um, back when I was a Buddhist, and, and uh, it, 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 it seemed like the most tantric of the three major branches. But um, I don't know. Tantra seems like really mystical to me and seems to be about... Okay, so it does have, I guess, that Dionysian element, though, right? But I feel like Nietzsche... I feel like that very, looking at it as Dionysian tells me that I don't think Nietzsche would have changed his mind if he'd been exposed to tantric Buddhism because he already associates the what he calls the Buddhistic uh, in Birth of Tragedy with a purely Dionysian society. Now, that confuses a lot of readers who first approach Birth of Tragedy because the Dionysian, what is that? Drunken revelry. It's the god of drunkenness. And so how could that be a Buddhistic culture if taken to the extreme? Well, really what he's talking about is the Dionysian is like the annihilation of the ego consciousness and the self versus other distinction. And um, you don't, so even though Buddhists don't drink intoxicants, what they do do is practice jhana or meditation. And I've got a theory about jhana. Um, oftentimes what the Buddha talks about in the uh, Pali Canon is, uh, you know, because there's a lot of parts of the Pali Canon that are just meant for monks. And it's just the Buddha talking to monks, being like, stay the course, good monks. Don't follow the, you know, your poisons of delusion and ignorance and uh, blah, 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 thirsting desire. Uh, and so, you know, he'll like go down the list in certain sutras where he's talking about, you know, do you need to indulge in intoxicants or have like lustful relations? No, now you have the pleasure of jhana. And I think there is like a liberatory ecstatic feeling that some people report in like, if not a full on ego death experience, but a sort of uh, in the higher jhanas, right, of Buddhism. And so my, my theory, I guess, if you can call it that, is that Jhana in Buddhism is like a, it's like f finding some way for your ascetics to pursue something that not only gives them a sense of like accomplishing things, because that's, unless you have something to work on and a goal you're moving towards, you can't really be happy. So you always have to have like a project or a task, like you don't find happiness and static contentment. Um, uh, I forget what exactly this theory is called in psychology, but it, it's just, it's almost uh, trivially obvious to me, right? Um, like happiness is found in movement. It's not, it's like when you, it's like when people finish their, their dissertation or their PhD and what happens? Are they, are they thrilled? No, they, the most common thing is that they get depressed because they were working on something that consumed their life for years. And then there's like, well, what now? And similarly, like people retire and then they die really quickly unless they have some sort of hobby or other calling that's making their life worthwhile. And so like it gives you something to work on and pursue, 
but it's something that is pleasurable and it's giving you a way to like create pleasure out of thin air in a way. And I know a lot of Buddhists would have a problem with that because they'd say like, that's not Buddhism. Like that's just becoming attached to jhana. Be the don't. And true enough in the Buddhist tradition, there's a lot of warning, like don't get attached to the high heady feelings of separating from self and other. But uh, in a way, that's just sort of a natural dialect that's dialectic that's going to happen, right? You have to give people that way of finding pleasure outside of worldly desires that, like, like use the Epicurean formula, right? Epicurus's whole deal is, yeah, it's fine to pursue happiness, just don't do it in a way that's going to cause you more unhappiness. And so I think the reasoning is, if people are just pursuing pleasure by just sitting there and staring at the fucking wall... They're not getting the pain that's coming with, like, thirsting and pursuing after, you know, all these other worldly things that can have all these other problems. That kind of took us far afield from your question, but whatever. Uh, what is the deal with the speculation? What is the deal? That's my Jerry Seinfeld impersonation. Uh, with the speculation that Nietzsche's sister took over his book and changed it. I assume you mean will to power. Uh, so you're... That's not exactly as you described. What... <laughs> happened is Nietzsche had a bunch of notes that Peter Gast, a.k.a. Heinrich Koslitz, and Elizabeth Fuster Nietzsche compiled and uh, put into uh, a volume they called Will to Power. Now Nietzsche was planning a magnum opus called Will to Power. The first volume of that is published. It's called The Antichrist. That's the first book of his revaluation of values. That's uh, And so they basically alleged like the full volume of Nietzsche's revaluation of values that have been called will to power. There were planned four volumes, right? They present this text, which is a compilation of Nietzsche's unpublished notes from the Naklas as being this volume. It's not, but it is actually Nietzsche's notes. It's just arranged in a way that's kind of dishonest. So like Kaufman, so this should tell you something. Kaufman's like the arch liberal anti-Nazi interpreter. Like, wants to interpret Nietzsche in a way that he can be useful for the liberal democratic humanist type person or existentialist or whatever, um, and is opposed to fascistic interpretations of Nietzsche. He still translates will to power and puts it out into the world. He thought that was a good thing to do. He just takes, the notes are just numbered and arranged in a certain way. He just puts in parentheses, like, here's where the note came from. And what you see is they've picked from all over different years and notebooks of Nietzsche's life and arrange them. It's not, it, like, if you were to put these notes in chronological order or the way they were actually found in the Naklas, you wouldn't get a structure or anything like what Elizabeth Nietzsche put forward. But some people take this and they way overstate this case where they're like, don't read Will to Power. It's some fabrication by Nietzsche's Nazi sister. That's not true. It's just, once you understand what it is, it's just his notes. It's, you shouldn't be afraid of that book. Now, should you read it, like, first? No. You should read Nietzsche's published works, the works that he actually finished, edited, and published, and presented in a form that he wanted it to be presented. But once you've done that, if you've read, like, a couple of his major works, there's no harm in picking up Will to Power, and you'll find a lot of really neat stuff in there that explains, goes into more depth sometimes. Sometimes it's, like, just a, like, tidbit of an idea that he never expanded on. But a lot of really interesting possibilities and questions there. Um, so this guy asks, uh, was Nietzsche gay? I've heard some people speculate that. Uh, I don't know. I remember a, a friend of mine when I was doing the, the Wagner episodes, um, she was like, were Nietzsche and Wagner gay together? That was like her first thought. Without, you know, And it's like, I, I don't know about that. Um, like, I think the reason why people say that is because they basically say that about any sort of, like, male historical figure who had, like, a, like, lack or perceived lack of, like, sexual relationships or partners in his life. Um, and so it's p possible, but, like, we're just speculating, right? We can't know. I mean, it's also just possible that he was just bad at being in relationships. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nietzsche would have thought that fascism is a sort of plebeian authoritarianism. Maybe. 
Yeah, I mean, you could put it like that because what it, like racial socialism, right? Could could be you could call it fascism, but that word means everything and nothing now. Like that just means bad thing. So like a more descriptive term for the Nazis might be like racial socialism rather than socialism among like being, you know, dictatorship of the proletariat, it's going to be a dictatorship of a certain race. And what Nietzsche says about that is, like, this appeals to the most average kind of person. Like, they can't be great individually, so they're going to be great as a race or as a nation. Uh, so they, like, create that that's what they do. Um, and that's the same thing with, like, the party man or the partisan, the person who, like, self-identifies with the party. They're, they're self-identifying with some broader thing that they're trying to claim that they are or they're a part of but that appeals to the most average or even below average kind of person um, and I think this is just as true today in terms of the fact that like you could almost just say almost it's almost not even interesting to say it but just as a truism like people who have things going on in their lives and like um, like who have a higher calling or just anything interesting that they're doing with their life are going to care less and less about this shit, about politics, uh, or like whatever the newest movement is, or, you know. Uh, there's an old Doug Stanhope joke where he's talking about whenever someone starts saying, like, I'm an Irish American, like, pointing out, like, where their European heritage is and super identifying with that as an American. Like, when they've probably never been to Ireland and don't know anything about it, they just, like, you know, wear, like, a four-leaf clover stuff or whatever and they like to get drunk on St. Patrick's Day he's like what a boring person that's always like the guy who has nothing going on in his life um okay do, 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 do. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit uh okay almighty ohm tantra is about using all as a way through pun intended no denial of this existence it's a radical empiricism okay uh interesting would you say Nietzsche's broader message is that comfort weakens? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, let's see here. How is mask different from will? So I think that for Nietzsche, the mask is something, you know, it's something that only can really occur among a being like ourselves which is a thinking being it's something that is uniquely human so like every kind of animal or even in some of his writings you could think that nietzsche is saying all phenomena even inanimate objects or like impersonal forces have a will they have a certain character of a certain type of like strength they're discharging onto the world that they're making felt in the world so um, whereas with the mask, right, that's something that comes with the ability to simulate or dissimulate or to dissemble. The, um, this has to do with, uh, should, everyone should check out, if you're interested in Nietzsche, um, on truth and lies in the non-moral sense or in the extra-moral sense. The reason why I say that, it's so short and it's on Wikisource, so you can read it for free really, really easily. And uh, translation's fine, what they have on there. And it's written, I think, the same year as Birth of Tragedy. It's not finished, so it ends a little bit abruptly. But one of the things that Nietzsche says is that the intellect unfolds its chief powers in dissimulation. Uh, that, you know, the, what does he say, the, the weaker natures among mankind among thinking beings because they've been denied the ability to wage war or wage combat with claws uh, and fangs fangs and, and sharp claws or something like that learn that they can this is basically Nietzsche talking about how the origin of like lying came about they learn that they uh, they can misrepresent they can use a symbol a signifier so a word a word concept right what a word concept is arises due to usefulness, not some sort of correspondence to an objective truth. So that's Nietzsche's first sort of insight, is that like we come up with these word concepts which are premised on the basis of this social contract. I, I hate to use that word, but like, you know, on like a really small scale, we might say like in a tribe, 
if you come up with a word that means like poisonous, there's sort of an idea that it's useful to have this word signifier that everyone agrees to use those word signifiers in the usual or conventional way because it you could say like I guess that corresponds to an objective truth in some way because it's like independently verified by the different group people individuals in the tribe but Nietzsche's point is that what the truth emerges as is your agreement to use the usual word signifiers it's something that exists within language within communication right we say a statement is true or false something that's communicated is true or false the truth isn't like an objective like noun thing that exists out there and so you agree to use the usual designations of like this plant is poisonous and if you say not poisonous safe when it actually it is poisonous you violated like that agreement and the reason then therefore for the emergence of lies is that weaker natures or weaker individuals among the tribe figure out that they could project weakness where actually strength or dangerousness exists as a way of getting the jump on someone or something of that nature basically right and so you could say then that like that's the origin of the mask is as thinking beings we discovered this ability it, like once you create the ability to communicate linguistically through these word concepts you also then by that very nature create the ability to dissemble and that's part of Nietzsche's big question is when you look at mankind how is it the will that a will to truth could have ever arisen amongst us it seems like the farthest possible thing from what could have been created because the immediate next step of creating these uh, designations through communication is that you create the ability for lies that we actually learned a lie before we come up with any idea of what the objective truth is because originally the truth is just uh, what he calls there's a really famous passage in on truth and lies in the non moral sense or in the extra moral sense depending on how you want to translate it what then is truth a movable host of metonymies anthropomorphisms etc right um, it's getting a little dark because uh, the Sun is going down so what I'm gonna do because I didn't have the lights on it here is I'm gonna turn on the lights Okay. All right, so let's, uh, yeah, much brighter now. <laughs> it's like night and day. Um, I'm also going to uh, switch to, I'm going to do something very un and I'm going to pour myself a little bit of whiskey. It's bourbon, actually. Okay. Let's go back here. Um, I think dedicating an episode to Al Alcides and why Nietzsche considered him in such a high regard be entertaining and a good example to a Nietzschean man. Alcides. I don't know who that is. Do you mean Alcibiades? Maybe? Because, I mean, if so, yeah, maybe. I don't know. It might be a while, though, because I keep thinking I'm going to get to a point in the podcast where, like, it's just free for all, like just start covering whatever I want where I'm like looking for things. And while I have gotten to the point where like finding some general idea in Nietzsche's of Nietzsche's that I haven't yet talked about is a bit difficult. There's a couple that will be next season, but for the most part, what I feel like I really need to cover is like the last of the major influences that I haven't covered. And then getting on to a couple of like the really important interpreters to come after Nietzsche um, and when I was sort of trying to plan out next season I realized you know I, I was like I'm at 24 episodes I, I am going to have plenty of time to cover whatever the hell I want to cover and I realized really quick I can fill up fill this up very quickly um, and so Nietzsche is the gift that keeps on giving there's just like an endless uh, wealth of topics you can cover related to Nietzsche's which is a blessing and a curse. Uh, Nathan Cross, I'm really enjoying listening to Slumbering Sun and Destroyer of Light. Well, thanks, Nathan. That's that's good to hear. We're about to go on tour. I'm very excited. 
that's today. It's July 5th. I'm leaving on July 20th for the first day, which will be in El Paso, which I know that's in Texas. So if you're not in Texas, uh, Austin to El Paso is like eight hours, something like that. I think actually maybe a little longer than that. It's longer to go from one side of the state, the other Texarkana to El Paso. That is a longer distance than Texarkana to Chicago. Texas is huge. Um, but so that will take us all the way out into the desert where it's still going to be hot as hell, but it's a dry heat. <laughs> so <laughs> that old, uh, that old cliche. Uh, let's do, 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 do. In the history of ideas, what is the next logical step to Nietzsche? Heidegger? Foucault? Uh, well, I assume you mean from Nietzsche, because you listed people after him. I would have a really hard time telling anyone to read Heidegger. And Foucault, well, he's a lot more uh, comprehensible. Um... Foucault is, while Heidegger might actually, like, Heidegger has his own new ideas. Not that Foucault doesn't. I'm trying to think of a way to say this. Heidegger, I feel like, even when I don't understand him or feel like he's being intentionally obtuse, a lot of the times when I read Heidegger, I get the impression that he's saying things that he's like, he'll comment on things Nietzsche said and he'll take a sentence, he'll take an idea that Nietzsche put forward in a sentence and then write like three paragraphs on it that make it more opaque and less understandable. Um, but I still feel that when I read Heidegger, I'm like, there's something here beyond uh, just what Nietzsche is saying that Heidegger is like trying to grasp at. A lot of people consider him like the last continental philosopher, um, but he's so difficult. And so I don't know. Foucault, I almost feel like takes like one aspect of Nietzsche and like hyper focuses on it and I don't want to say exaggerates it but interprets it in a really specific way um, like he takes the idea really when people are talking about uh, these postmodern philosophers reducing all things to power Foucault is who they're talking about it's funny though because Foucault went like uh, individualist libertarian with his direction of his thought. So even though he started out as like a Marxist, he doesn't remain as a Marxist. So um, he's not really the boogeyman that he's been made out to be. But, and like he does, he does bring up some really interesting shifts in the way that we punish and think about punishment and guilt. And if you have read Nietzsche and you already have that basis, it could be interesting to read Foucault as well. So I would say that Foucault is a little bit easier um, but I don't know. I think Heidegger is maybe more profound, but more difficult. And I guess that's always the trade-off, right? I would say, hmm, uh, the Kyoto School is fairly interesting. I've read some of their stuff. Uh, who else? Somebody asked, have I read Oswald Spangler? I have not. Um, who else? Somebody, somebody brings up Thomas Ligotti. So he's a pessimist. Um, he says, are you familiar with Thomas Ligotti's description and analysis of Nietzsche as a perverted pessimist? And if so, any thoughts, comments? It appears in his The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. You're going to have to remind me about what the meaning of perverted pessimist is exactly, but Ligotti is another person who responds to Nietzsche. And if you want to test your resolve uh, as somebody who truly loves life, then read Thomas Ligotti. Remember, it's not a matter of courage of conviction. It's having the strength for courage for an attack on your convictions. Uh, I just realized I poured this and haven't drank it, so cheers, everybody. Okay. Uh, let's see. Visibly Jacked says, Be interested in some more personal videos, like how you first encountered Nietzsche and what resonates particularly with you, etc. Uh, I've talked about this a bit on the RSS feed of the podcast. I guess I just haven't talked about it much uh, in the YouTube context, but how I first encountered Nietzsche, I mean, like with many people, I 
encountered Nietzsche when I was taking a philosophy class. And at first I really didn't like Nietzsche just because I didn't really understand it. You know, I was a militant atheist at that time. And so I really liked um, Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian. And I was like hoping that Nietzsche would like be something like along those lines. And he wasn't at all. And I, I didn't, half the time I didn't understand what he was talking about. But uh, I did like pick up Beyond Good and Evil and, and Genealogy of Morality. And I remember Beyond Good and Evil, that one didn't really take. I think it was Genealogy of Morality where the, that I read where it first clicked with me, where I actually was understanding the things he was saying. Not all of it, but I got the point, right? I got the bare bones of the point of basically every essay, uh, the first, second, and third essay. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if I, like, absorbed it all, but I distinctly remember that moment. Of, of where I was like, oh, wow. Like, what he's saying here is that we... <laughs> we we uh, had to have it beaten into us to have a memory. And that's why we have guilt and bad conscience and all of these things. And, um, you know, uh, the whole of course, the whole analysis on Rosantamont and all of that. Uh, and then I think I fell in love with Nietzsche when I was reading Birth of Tragedy... We were out on the road. It was so I read Beyond Good and Evil. I revisited it after Genealogy of Morality, and it made a lot more sense. And that that book really captivated me and sucked me in, drew me in. And then Birth of Tragedy was like where I really fell in love, um, which, you know, in context of his broader philosophy, that's an inferior book. But it was I think the context I was reading it in, um, like I was out on tour, I was on the road, and. Uh, you know, reading this book about, you know, these twin art forces where Nietzsche was sort of bringing up these considerations about art that I'd never heard anyone really think about or, you know, uh, it had never been put to me that way. And he made sense of, uh, you know, I think what it is too, and I'm, uh, maybe I'll announce this here, guys. Um, so I may have a book getting published that's not only contains some autobiographical information, but an inquiry on art, because this question has kind of concerned me for a long time. And it was probably Birth of Tragedy that opened that door for me, because artists are really unself-reflective. Um, artists are basically, we, especially musicians, right? It's all just rock and roll, dude. Don't think about it, right? Like, uh, it's just, you know, just listen to your muse and don't worry about anything else. And, but when I applied like philosophical inquiry to the questions of art of like, what exactly are we doing in the artistic process? I realized that it is, it's not an easy question. And it, it was very concerning to me. Concerning is maybe the wrong word, but it became very urgent for me to figure this out because this is like what I'd staked my whole life on, right? I've staked my whole life on art and like, what the hell is this? What is the value of art? What are we doing when we do art? And a lot of people have really cheap sort of pithy ideas about art in terms of, you know, uh, it's just self-expression and it's just the joy of self-expression. And, uh, you know, uh, or they'll put forward some idea about art that might sound good or might describe some kinds of artistic expression, but it, it's clearly not the whole story where it can't account for every thing that we put under the label art. And so over the years, I eventually, I wrote and read a lot about this and it's all coming out in a book eventually. But the beginning of that was birth of tragedy because Nietzsche has an aesthetic theory for basically <laughs> You know, what is the famous line from the...
lacking the discipline to control self-destructive tendencies like addiction or justify a feeling of helplessness. Well, <laughs> this is sort of relates to when Nietzsche talks about free will and unfree will, and he criticizes both of them as being a, uh, both being a sort of mental rationalization for whatever kind of person we already are, uh, if that makes sense. So he says, like, you know, we certainly can have done with this idea of free will as, you know, the self-caused cause is the most absurd, like, uh, rape and per perversion of logic so far. So, you know, N Nietzsche doesn't believe that we can be this, like, arbitrary, causeless cause. Uh, you know, that there's this, like, intermediary entity called the ego consciousness between your body and the actions that your body carries out. But then he goes on to say, like, the people who believe in unfree will, who believe themselves to be determined, they basically see themselves as trapped in this mechanistic chain of causes and effects, and they can't do anything about it. Um, that this springs from a sense of inner weakness. Like, they feel helpless and unable to control themselves, so that's why they gravitate towards this idea of unfree will. And that really your position on something metaphysical, like whether we have free will or not, is more of a reflection of you than anything else. And so I guess my answer, which may be a little unsatisfying, is that if you use the idea of innate drives as a way to uh, excuse your own lack of discipline and refusal to take responsibility for yourself, well then, of course, that is exactly the viewpoint that you would take. Because it's your perspective. That's your reflection of who and what you are. Um, now, is Nietzsche writing to those people? Is he trying to provide them with that? No. What he's trying to, I think, actually do is get rid of this notion of um, sinfulness or moral responsibility. Not to make us... There's that line in Zarathustra, right? It's not about freedom to or freedom from. It's about freedom to. Many have been freed from a yoke. But um, what can you do to show that you deserve to be freed from that yoke? So Nietzsche getting rid of moral responsibility in a way is to open up more possibilities for us, for our lives and our action and our character. It, like to, because he sees how this artificial ersatz moral condemnation and layering on of sin upon the human condition basically just ser serves to like constrain our thought and our possibilities for humankind. So that's what he's trying to do. Now, are people going to take that and use it to justify their own helplessness? Yeah, but they're going to do that anyway, just so you know. Okay, uh, I've kind of skipped around, by the way. I, I think I was, because uh, I'm seeing the same comment here. I, I think I did that unintentionally. I think it's because like, a new comment will pop up and then it like, I don't know, whatever. You guys don't care. Uh, what were Nietzsche's views in comedy? Did he find it as important as tragedy or as a lower form of art? Um, yeah, it's a lower form of art to Nietzsche. Nietzsche thinks... Tra so it's not just... Like, he thinks what he thinks about tragedy for, like, an anthropological historical reason. Tragedy in the Greek context does actually come out of like a mythological religious ritual that was like had profound spiritual significance that was supposed to be like revealing something about the, the, the mystery of all life. Um, and so tragedy that I'm trying to think of the, the quickest way to explain this. Basically you have a tragic hero, right? And they're a noble figure but either because of some flaw or just because it's fated to be, by the end of the story, they fail, they have a downfall, and often they suffer a horrible fate. And it may even be like an ignoble fate, like Oedipus. Originally, Nietzsche argues, and there is evidence for this, the hero of the tragedy was always Dionysus. And then over time, it developed to where there were these different characters, but they would actually wear, like, it was basically seen as like this hero is the mask of Dionysus. And so there's something really profound about that of like 
because it's like the Dionysian is, is the primordial pain and contradiction at the heart of nature, that primordial pain and contradiction is revealed in the noble individual who tilts against impermanence and the inherent suffering and mortality, the fact that we do all fail, right? We do not establish lasting being or lasting everlasting happiness or peace. Um, but these figures in their striving and suffering and eventual destruction and the fact that then Dionysus is rent asunder and then reborn again, right? That the, the cycle, samsara continues, right? We can take our joy in the fact that samsara continues. I'm very anti-Buddhist in that way. But, uh, so that's where tragedy comes from, anthropologically. Comedy, uh, it's, it is, historically speaking, again, a plebeian art form. And maybe the reason for this would be the aristocracy needs to represent pain and suffering as a neurosis of the healthy. That's Nietzsche's theory, and as he puts it in the preface to Birth of Tragedy, that um, they were always looking for more suffering. They're trying to take on more conflict, make things harder for themselves because there are people who are strong and at the top, at the zenith of society. People who are at the bottom rungs of society don't need, they're already suffering. They don't need an art form that creates more suffering. So they have comedy, which makes everything sort of like farcical and unserious and lighthearted. And then you have like the new attic comedy, which comes out of uh, Euripides, which Nietzsche doesn't really talk about like sort of the, the common uh, historical genre of comedy, which comes from, I believe, the phallic songs. So tragedy comes out of the Dionysian dithyram that evolves into the Dionysian chorus, and then you get Greek tragedy. Comedies came from phallic songs and, like, just sort of dirty, raunchy, popular humor, right? That's the original form of the comedy. The new Attic comedy, Nietzsche has a lot of problems with because it's influenced by Socrates, and he says... Uh, again, I'm trying to like find the, the quickest way to explain it. He says it's like the individual can be confined within a limited sphere, or human life can be confined within a limited sphere of solvable problems. That's how the new addict comedy portrays life. So it's not this unavoidable fatalistic tragedy. It's like, oh, um, it's why uh, you could say like, you know, I, I forget who said this, but like all events viewed from up close could be seen as a comedy, but viewed from afar could be a tragedy. Maybe it's actually the other way around. I, but I guess that's Nietzsche's point, right? Is that, like, you know, you could make a comedy out of, like, one set of circumstances that ends well for everyone involved. But the sort of the secret truth of all life is that uh, um, in the long run, it does not end up that way. Um, and so it is literally a lower form of art in terms of, like, it is more plebeian. And that's true of the new Attic comedy as well, because it's the influence of Socrates, who is a pleb. Um, but, yeah, so that's the answer. I won't spend any more on that. What about Sartre being something contingent? Being as something contingent is what I get out of him. I have read a lot of Sartre's fiction. I have not read a lot of his existentialism. And uh, so I will withhold judgment on that. Somebody asks, have you read Deleuze's Nietzsche and philosophy? I have. Uh, would you ever cover Gilles Deleuze in a future episode? I will. Uh, that's happening next season. Um, I agree with the Kyoto Nishitani and Kitaro's example. Yes, Kyoto school. Uh, I'm a Bathory connoisseur. Which philosophical doctrines could attract me? Do you mean the historical figure of Elizabeth Bathory? Or do you mean the band Bathory? So you're just like, you're into black metal? Yeah, read Thomas Ligotti. Read Emile Cioran. Uh, you know, uh, I feel like most people who read black metal would would be into those. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is from the guy who asked me about Ligotti characterizing Nietzsche as a perverted pessimist. Excerpt. Among other things, Nietzsche is famed as a promoter of human survival just as long as enough of the survivors follow his lead as a perverted pessimist, one who has consecrated himself to loving life exactly because it is the worst thing imaginable. Yeah, that's what we started out talking about at the beginning of this uh this um, uh, live stream. It's what Nietzsche calls a pessimism of strength, right? Um, we can see why Ligotti, the way he puts it, would, would say that it's perverted pessimism. 
But, I mean, if we think about it for just a couple seconds, I mean, <laughs> who's, to, to flip it on its head, the way Nietzsche would respond to Ligotti is like, who's the perverted sick one here? The one who says that, like, life is inherently terrible and it's better, we should all just fucking kill ourselves and we never should have been born? Or, uh, you know, we should, or that, like, the pain of life can make you stronger and the brevity of life, its shortness, can make it sweeter. Um, which is like a healthier attitude. I, I mean, I don't know. It's like, like Shiaran says, the problem with suicide is one always kills himself too late. Right? You're already born. You're already, you're already stuck here with the problem of mortality and uh, the existential problems of like our sheer ignorance and not knowing who and what you are in the cosmos and where you're going or why you're here or any of these things. You're already settled with all those problems. And uh, you can always kill yourself later, right? You can always die later, and you will die later, right? So um, I don't understand the point necessarily of adopting a life philosophy, saying life is bad, and then going on living. And Ligotti's been asked about this in interviews, where he's just like, he, he takes it as an insult that people say, well, why don't you just kill yourself? But, um, I mean, I don't think that's a totally, like, cynical thing to say. I mean, Camus said that's, like, the most philosophical question ever. Should I kill myself or go get a cup of coffee? That's what the question everyone has to ask and deal with every day. And Ligotti has come down on the side, philosophically, of kill you should kill yourself. It's not worth going to get the cup of coffee. The cup of coffee isn't going to alleviate the terror of the human condition. So why don't you, right? And and the real reason is, as Rust Cole says, a true detective, he, he lacks the constitution for suicide. That's all it is. Um, but there's no, like, I don't know. Nietzsche has another passage in, I believe it's Eke Homo, where he just says, whether one says yes or no to life is not, there's no argument you can make, ultimately. It's a completely subjective, irreducibly subjective valuation. And there's no right or wrong answer. What he then goes, where he goes from there is to say it's just a reflection of whether you're psychologically healthy or sick. And he would say by that metric that Ligoti is sick. But again, if you have this yes saying view to life, you should really read Conspiracy Against the Human Race. It'll probably give you a crisis of, <laughs> of faith. <laughs> But, you know, if you're not strong enough for that, then what are you, what are you strong enough for? It's just words, just ideas, right? Um, okay. Did the study of philosophers bring you real-life practical wisdom? Are you a better person because of it? Yeah. So what I've taken from the unfree will idea is not to, like, forgive myself for, like, being undisciplined or whatever. I have been able to forgive other people a lot more easily. I am much more at peace after reading Nietzsche with the fact that people are the way they are. Everyone is sort of like their own natural phenomena. And just like I wouldn't be mad, like I would be mad, right, if a storm knocked over my house or a tornado did. But I wouldn't impute moral culpability onto it. And that's how I can view other people now. And especially people who are maybe not as... I'm trying to say this politely and in a, not in an elitist way, maybe not as self-reflective or insightful as myself who haven't done some of that similar work on themselves or trying to understand themselves, right? I'm a lot more forgiving of them, I guess you could say. Um, so, yeah, I'll just move on from there. Uh, let's see. A lot of questions here. Just gonna kind of skip down. Um, oh, my mic was dead. Okay. I hope that wasn't for too long. Um, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of questions here, uh, but it, I've been going for over an hour, so. Um, okay, yeah, Lucas says, it's the other way. Up close life is a tragedy, but from far it's a comedy. And that might have actually been Nietzsche who said that. So I don't know. 
there's uh, certainly contradictions in his thought. Um, I'm going to go, I did promise the patrons, this is what I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to spend the last part of the time here. I did promise some of the patrons I would ask, answer their questions on stream if they drop them in a thread, so I'm going to do that really quick, but I think they're pretty short. Um, okay, so Deborah Flores asks, how many books have you read? I don't know. Uh, Paul Lazar, hi, I love your podcast. I listen and re-listen off, and I wanted to ask you about how you acquired your knowledge of philosophy. Are you an autodidact, or did you attend university? Best, Paul. I did attend university, but I didn't finish. Um, now, am I an autodidact? Well, that means self-taught, and I wouldn't consider myself that. I mean, I have all these books, right? Now, nobody taught me the book. I just had to read it and understand it myself. But um, maybe this is a good... Uh, final thought, I guess, for the, the live stream to, to bring up. Um, and it, it has to do with, I've been asked the question recently, what version of X, Y, and Z Nietzsche book should I get? What translation should I get? Is this translation good or bad? And I was, I can't take full credit for this. I don't remember exactly who said what, but I was talking about this with my friend. He goes by the, uh, Quinn Williams. He's been on the podcast. 